All right, let us get started on this fine December afternoon. My name is Eric Arneson from George Washington University. Uh, I am the co-chair of this seminar, the Washington History Seminar. My other co-chair, uh, Christian Osterman, is out of the country, uh, as he often uh, is uh, on uh, the business uh, that he carries out for the Wilson Center, so I'll be doing this solo this afternoon. Uh, this is the last seminar of the season. We'll take a brief hiatus for the holidays uh, and reconvene in January. For those of you who are new, the seminar is a joint effort of the Woodrow Wilson Center uh, and the American Historical Association's National History Center. Uh, and I never tire of thanking the folks who behind the scenes make this possible, Pete Beerstecker for Wilson, uh, and Amanda Perry for the National History Center. Uh, these are the folks who have mastered the logistics uh, and make it easy for us to pull this off, though their efforts are by no means uh, easy. It's just the invisible labor that always goes into making this seminar possible. We like to thank uh, those who have supported the seminar over the years. Uh, the History Department at George Washington University is one institutional sponsor of this seminar, as are any number of anonymous donors. The year is winding down, uh, and there's still time for you to write your uh, tax-deductible checks uh, to the seminar to help us uh, put on this program. We do it really on a shoestring. Uh, and any support that we get uh, from participants and others uh, allows us to do things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do, bring people from a farther afield uh, and not just to the D.C. area. So should you be so inclined, we would be so inclined uh, to accept uh, any donation uh, that you might uh, wish uh, to make. If you have one of these devices, please turn it off. Uh, as we all know from experience, they go off at the most inopportune times. And if you haven't picked up one of these outside the door, please do so on your way out. Or if you haven't received an email about this, let us know. You will note on the second page, the winter and spring lineup is complete. And I think we have a great lineup uh, of, uh, kind of a very diverse range of books and topics uh, for the uh, spring winter season. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you all back here in this room when we reconvene on January 14th, when we launch with a cluster of books uh, on a variety of uh, international topics, uh, all put out by Cornell University Press. So uh, we hope you will join us uh, early in the new year. I am delighted to introduce our speaker this afternoon, uh, who, as you know, is Adam Howard. Uh, he is the acting co-director at the US Department of State's Office of the Historian. Uh, he is also, I'm pleased to say, uh, an adjunct professor of history uh, and, an and international affairs uh, at the George Washington University. Uh, in 2017, he published uh, a book, Sewing the Fabric of Statehood, Garment Unions, American Labor, and the Establishment of the State of Israel with the University of Illinois Press, uh, long a major publisher of works in U.S. labor history. He is also the documentary editor of three Fruce volumes, each of which covers U.S. foreign relations uh, in the Middle East during the 1970s. Uh, and this afternoon, he will be talking on this new book, Sewing the Fabric of Statehood. Adam. Thank you, Eric. And thank you, everybody, for coming. I know we're getting close to the holidays, so I appreciate people taking the time to come to this session. Um, before I go any further, I just have to do one thing to make sure I don't get in trouble at my main job at the State Department which is put out a disclaimer because everything you're gonna hear from me today, including during the Q&A, are my opinions, and they do not necessarily represent those of the US government. So with that out of the way, I can dig into where this whole project comes from. So in government, we use a term called the bluff or bluff, B-L-U-F, bottom line up front. So let me just say what I feel this book ultimately did, and then I'll explain why I ultimately approached it that way. First, I argue how the American labor movement centered in the garment industry uh, was responsible both for playing a critical role in the building of Israel through domestic influence, in other words, pressuring Congress, the president, uh, as well as the British Labor Party, but also how they operated transnationally, using their own resources to influence, or I'm sorry, to uh, build, to help create 
the structure for what will become the state of Israel. So it's really two parts, one domestic influence, the other a transnational operation by what I argue is a major NGO. Most people don't look at American labor and typically put it into the class of non-government organizations that get talked about. But based on every definition I've seen, including material I was reading 20 years ago, it should fit within it and it should be discussed in those terms. Now, why Sidney Hillman up here? I'm sure for those of you who have any background in American labor history, he might be a familiar name. And I start with him because this was my entree into the project. Uh, Kurt Corman, who's a professor of history at Cornell University, had written an article back in the 80s about Sidney Hillman and how after World War II, he became very interested in helping with the establishment of at least a Jewish homeland in Palestine. He died of a heart attack suddenly in late 1946, so he wasn't a major part of the story from what I could tell, but I was very intrigued because 20 years ago when I was a graduate student, I was very interested in how domestic politics could influence foreign relations. I never bought the adage that domestic politics, uh, politics stops at the water's edge. I always thought there was more of a mix that needed to be addressed in scholarship, and I thought this is my entree. Because although I knew of many different non-government organizations that were involved with the helping in establishing Israel, I had not really heard much about American labor's role in it, and I was actually pleased when I found there hadn't been much scholarship done on it at the time, which meant I had an opening. Um, but as I dug in, I realized that this was much more than just some sort of domestic political issue, that there was, as I said, a transnational element. Typically, when you look at the scholarship of American labor in terms of its involvement internationally, most of the time I was seeing it within what they call the corporatist structure, meaning labor was operating in coordination with the U.S. government, whether it was uh, in Italy uh, in the 40s or South America or Vietnam. There were always places where they mixed with the U.S. government, cooperated with the U.S. government in helping further U.S. policy goals. But in this case, I found that American labor organizations were actually going against what many in the U.S. government were arguing for, especially in the State Department when you get to the 1940s, and people like Secretary of State George Marshall who do not want to see the U.S. or other organizations, for that matter, helping to establish Israel. So that's the background I wanted to just touch on. When it comes to someone like Sidney Hillman, of course, a major player through American labor in the mid-20th century. He's the president of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America. He's the founder of the Congress of Industrial Organizations in the 1930s. He's also a founder of the American Labor Party, which I'll get to later in this talk. And there's a famous, I suspect, apocryphal story about how when Franklin Roosevelt was running for his fourth term in 1944. He had Sidney Hillman as part of his uh, re-election campaign, and apparently he was so important to the campaign that Roosevelt said to anybody who had a question, said, clear it was Sidney. I don't know if that's true or not, but that showed how important someone like Sidney Hillman from rising up from the garment unions, this immigrant who had come over to the United States in the early 20th century, what level of influence and power American labor had gotten to by the 1940s, and arguably that's the halcyon days talk after in the Q&A about how it's changed since this period, but this was the entree. I thought that I would find more people like Sidney Hillman who would help me understand the story. Max Saritsky's another big player, probably more so than Hillman in this book, because he's from the beginning playing a prominent role. And what's interesting with Max Saritsky in the opening of the book, I use this quote from a 1938 speech where he says, we cannot look to government for this, this being helping established what was then Jewish Palestine. Uh, it is a task that we must undertake as private citizens. And that really helped me sort of visualize the transnational element, the idea that Zeritsky recognized as early as 1938 that those working in the American labor movement were going to need to use their own resources to help build the infrastructure within what was then Jewish Palestine. Again, another person who's not well known because his union wasn't as large, um, he was president of the United Hat. Capra Millinery Workers International Union, but he was a player when it came to uh, helping found the CIO. He was also a uh, major player with the American Labor Party, and he also founded an important organization I'll get to later in the talk that was involved in helping coordinate the American labor response when it came to Palestine after, at the end of World War II. He was a labor Zionist, and I thought, this makes sense. I knew something about labor Zionism, and so I assume this project would take me back to labor Zionism as the explanation for why the American labor movement wanted to get involved in helping a Jewish homeland in Palestine, ultimately a Jewish state in Palestine. I assume that many of these labor leaders would appreciate the philosophy of labor Zionism, which talks about how it was important in the early, late 19th, early 20th century. Philosophically, they believed that 
Jews needed to get back to the land. They needed to become farmers again, which they hadn't been allowed to in Europe, where they'd always been restricted from either owning land, being farmers, or in this case, in Palestine, developing a working class of workers who are Jewish in Palestine. That would also be part of the labor Zionist vision. The idea of getting away from being the merchants, getting away from being the usurers, all of those stereotypes that had haunted Jews in their experience through European history. So I thought this must be the answer. Here's the problem, though. I get to my first instance where I see American labor getting involved, and it makes sense, the Balfour Declaration. The American, Feder of La uh, American Federation of Labor endorses the Balfour Declaration. For those who are not familiar, this was a letter written by Lord uh, Arthur James Balfour, who was the Foreign Secretary for the British during World War I, and he wrote this to uh, Lionel Walter Rothschild, one of the Rothschild family, himself a Zionist, a uh, prominent member of the Jewish community in England. And in this letter, Balfour talks about how the British government it looks sympathetically upon establishing a homeland in Palestine, presumably after the war, presumably the Ottoman Empire will be no more, and the British would fill that vacuum. And so I thought, great, this is where the story should start. And the book does start there. But what I found out was the people who wanted to endorse this within the American Federation of Labor were the elite. Samuel Gompers, the president of the AFL, wanted to endorse this, not because he cared about labor Zionism or any other aspect of Zionism, but because he wanted to support Woodrow Wilson's war aims. Woodrow Wilson had endorsed the Balfour Declaration. And for Woodrow Wilson, this was something that fit within his 14 points. This fit within his vision for the New World Order. And Gompers, who owed much to Wilson during the war because Wilson had, in order to ensure the war effort and the labor effort for the war effort was stable, had done things to help labor in a way that made Samuel Gompers very happy. So this was really something from the top rather than from the bottom. You don't see the garment union leadership really pushing for this. And the reason is because they're not labor Zionists like I thought. Labor Zionists in the United States exist, but they're a very small minority within the American trade union movement during this period of time. And that brought me to what I later discovered was absolutely critical to understanding this period, the Bund. The formal name, General Federation of Jewish Workers in Lithuania, uh, Poland, and Russia is really the dominant part of the story. I use David Dubinsky here because he came as a young David Dubinsky when he first came over to the United States when he had a lot of revolutionary zeal. Um, and a lot of these young men coming over in the night, and women coming over in the 1900s and 19 teens to the United States had come out of this milieu of the Bund. And the Bund had all, all, total antipathy towards labor Zionism, antipathy towards all Zionism. They saw it as a nationalist distraction. It's a poison like any good socialist would see. These were committed socialists who believed that through Jewish cultural identity, one could then create, in the end, a socialist utopia, meaning no nationalist identity. Jews should stay where they are and focus on getting their rights as Jews in those countries but there shouldn't be any sort of immigration to Palestine. They call that escapism, a way to try to avoid what they needed to do, which was focus on the problems within Russia, within Poland, within Lithuania, and all other parts of Europe. And so the Bund was very much focused on embracing Jewish culture and identity, especially Yiddish culture. And for those not familiar, Zionism and labor Zionism were focused on the revival of Hebrew and getting rid of Yiddish. So there's all kinds of clashes that are gonna take place between Bundists and labor Zionists. And if you look at the trade union movement, especially the garment unions, the majority of the rank and file, as well as the leadership like David Dubinsky, are Bundists. Now what I found, which is interesting though, is that they are not anti-Zionist in its entirety. Some of them are what we call non-Zionists. They don't align with labor Zionists or any aspect of Zionism, but over time, they become non-Zionists. And I'll explain that nuance in terms of what a non-Zionist is versus an anti-Zionist as we get into this discussion because it really evolves over time. 19 teens, very few people who are Bundists are open in any way to a discussion about endorsing the Balfour Declaration or being pro uh, labor Zionist. But it's gonna shift over time. Dubinsky's gonna be a great example of that. Someone who identified as a Bundist, as a young man, but like many of his generation over time, living in the United States, not having to deal with the secret polices anymore, not having to deal with all of the restrictions and the prejudice that they had to experience in Europe, they start to modify. They start to adjust, and a lot of them start to also rise up in the ranks of the leadership. And as they do, they start to lose the revolutionary zeal. And so some of them become, again, what I 
radical non-Zionists, meaning they will not have an antipathy necessarily towards aspects of developing Jewish Palestine and a workers' movement in Jewish Palestine. And so that's one of the things that really I had to come to realize over a period of about 20 years from the 19-teens to the 1930s. This, this takes time. So the Bund is where you really have to start. And by starting with the Bund, you realize, okay, the American Federation of Labor did endorse the Balfour Declaration, it's true. And they will always cite that in the years after. But it was really something done at the highest level to appease the president. It had very little to do with the rank and file. This is really where it should start. Even though I do start with the Balfour Declaration, Max Pine, who is the Secretary for the United Hebrew Trades. And this is someone who emigrated to the United States about a decade before the Dubinskys and the Hillmans and the Zeritskys. And why is that key? Because he comes over before the Bund was even created in Eastern Europe. The Bund was created in 1897. Pine comes over in late 1880s. He's not part of this revolutionary zeal of the Bund. He's a socialist, a committed socialist, but he doesn't have this strong antipathy towards labor Zionism that others do. He's not a Zionist, he makes that clear. But again, he doesn't have the antipathy, he doesn't see Zionism as this nemesis, this nationalist poison that should be pushed to the side. And what ends up happening is he's, he embraces a delegation that comes over from Palestine between 1921 and 1922. And this delegation is from an organization called Histadrut. Histadrut forms in 1920, otherwise known as the General Federation of Jewish Workers in Palestine. And this is where there had been competing labor organizations in Palestine, and they decided that they would create one large federation called Histadri. And Max Pine meets with this delegation, and he's taken with them. He thinks, okay, I don't really have any interest in this nationalist element within labor Zionist philosophy. But there's a very interesting practical element here, because this is a powerful labor movement that is developing in Palestine starting in 1920, 21. And this is something that's probably worth supporting. We're not supporting a nationalist movement, but we should be considering supporting a fellow labor movement. And so Max Pine is really, and from the project I do here, is really sort of the founding father, I would argue, of the trade union movement's push to really help support what becomes Jewish Palestine through the Jewish workers' movement embodied in Histadrut. Now, Histadrut is, is an organization that really impressed Pine and others later because it was so progressive compared to, in many ways, to the United States labor movement. Things like Social Security, subsidized housing, these kinds of elements already existed through Histadrut in the early 1920s, something the U.S. wouldn't see for another decade or more. Um, and the other thing you'll note here, he is the spearhead behind the key fundraising campaign that will go on every year from this point forward for decades to come. And it becomes known as the Histadrut campaign. At the time, they called it the Gewerkschaften campaign. This was a Yiddish term that the United Hebrew Trades was known as, and so that was the name most people knew it as, the Gewerkschaften campaign, but it becomes, within a decade, the Histadrut campaign. And it's through this that we see money raised, initially tens of thousands of dollars, then hundreds of thousands of dollars as we move through the decades, and then ultimately it gets into the millions by the time we get to the 1950s. But this is where I saw the transnational element really coming into play whereby money was being raised, that money was then being transmitted to Histadrut, and Histadrut not only was involved in all of the progressive elements I mentioned, it also ran the military in this proto-government that was developing in Palestine, the Haganah, is part of Histadrut. So the money being raised and sent over wasn't just helping purely a labor movement, it was really in many ways helping a nationalist enterprise. And that's something that others, who again come from this Bundes tradition, really had some problems with. So I don't want to give you the impression that Max Pine solved all the problems, but he was so well respected within, the, especially the Jewish labor movement based in New York, the garment industry, that he was someone who was able to sort of bridge the gap in a way that started momentum in this direction of raising money, raising awareness, getting people on board who had mixed feelings initially, and helping them see it as something that was a positive in terms of helping a fellow labor movement. Fundraising, as I've mentioned now, is really the key to understanding this. This is a cover from a program. This is all the way up in 1942, because I didn't see any from the 20s or 30s. But 1942 was uh, when they started to make really sophisticated ones. And you'll notice the classic socialist iconography here on the front cover with the, I don't know how well you can see it, but the man working the fields of grain, woman holding farm animals, the fields behind them. Um, again, the images, the rhetoric very much fit within the socialist iconography at the time. And it's Histadrut that is providing 
the images, providing so much in the language, providing so many of the statistics, the information that is then transmitted to people like Max Pine, who then have these annual campaigns, ways to help raise money. And by the 1930s, Max Pine dies in 1928, but by the 1930s, there's a formal organization called the National Committee for Labor Palestine, which develops. And this formal organization comes up with all kinds of ways to try to raise money, not just through an annual fundraiser, but through different kinds of ways. For example, there's what's called the Music Festivals Night, and I, would, I got a kick out of the 1936 program. Bob Hope was the MC, lots of entertainers from the New York area. Uh, and so the idea was let's find all kinds of different ways to raise awareness among all of the working class in New York, but also throughout the United States. These campaigns, these fundraisers were not limited to New York. New York happened to be where the locus of power and influence was when it came to the Stuck Root campaigns, but it was not limited to just New York. So fundraising is really the big focal point of the book when it comes to the 1930s and helping Jewish Palestine through the Hizdun Group. Of course, the 1930s is also the decade where American labor starts to reach new power and influence it couldn't have imagined even a decade before. And a big reason for that is the Wagner Act or the National Labor Relations Act of 1935. This is where you get the unions are able to have elections to vote on whether they can organize into unions, but also collective bargaining. So this is where you're going to start to see people like Sidney Hillman, David Dubinsky gaining more and more influence at the White House and more and more influence in the New York, and specifically in New York, but also Chicago, where Sidney Hillman is based. And so their power and influence becomes greater and greater. This is a photo from Pins and Needles. This was a Broadway uh, review that was ran from 1937 to 1940. This is pictures from 1938. And that's David Dubinsky, older David Dubinsky now, to the right of Franklin Roosevelt. Um, and it was remarkable. It's a Broadway production. I heard it was revived in 2016. I have no idea until recently. Uh, interestingly enough, directed by an African-American dancer named Catherine Dunham. Uh, but it used women who were the garment workers who wanted to act. And so they were involved in these performances, which celebrated the union, celebrated through the union's history. And it was something that, of course, would get, in this case, a White House performance, command performance in front of Franklin Roosevelt. That shows how far these garment unions in particular, but also generally speaking, the AFL and at this point the CIA had come. Briefly, the CIO for the, did I say CIA? I should say CIO. Sorry. Uh, it's work in my head. The CIO, the Congress, initially it was the Conference of in, uh, Industrial Organizations, then the Congress of Industrial Organizations. A lot of these garment union leaders who I've already shown images of were major players in making that happen. This was where there were many in the garment unions, but also people like John Lewis, the United Mine Workers, who felt they needed to, the American labor movement had to organize unskilled workers, or it was missing out on a huge population of workers who could ensure that the American labor movement became more powerful and also its voice was reaching all through the working class, not just the, the highly skilled workers of the AFL. There was a schism, of course, for those of you who have familiarity with the background, it's not a major part of the story. Um, David Dubinsky and Max Zeritsky, who were involved in the initial discussions, break off and keep their loyalty with the AFL. Sidney Hillman goes off with the CIO, along with John Lewis. And so you have this schism of rivals between the AFL and CIO. So in this book, you'll never see AFL-CIO. That's a merger that doesn't come until 1955. It's not even something that can be talked about until after 1948, when the CIO was purging out communists from within its ranks. But from 1936 to 48, which this book really focuses in on, the CIO and the AFL are intense rivals. Despite that, this is the one issue that always brought together the leadership of the AFL and CIO. Philip Murray, the president of the CIO throughout this period, and William Green, the president of the American Federation of Labor in this period, the one time you'll see them get together on the same page is on the issue of helping his Dudru and working together in terms of trying to bring about what will become first a Jewish homeland and then ultimately a Jewish state. That discussion of homeland versus state switches more towards the end of World War II. Now, of course, at the same time that you have especially these Jewish labor leaders gaining in prominence within the United States during the 1930s. You have a rise in anti-Semitism throughout not just Europe but the United States, but of course the persecution of German Jews, which starts almost immediately after the Nazis take power in early 1933. This image is actually from Kristallnacht in 1938, but I really want to focus on just the early 30s to show how important American labor was when it came to these issues. Uh, 1933, almost immediately after the Nazis seized power, the American Federation of Labor implements a boycott of German goods. Uh, and also, as I'll show here, 
helps back an organization that forms called the Jewish Labor Committee. Now, the Jewish Labor Committee is comprised of some labor Zionists, but primarily those Bundists I mentioned earlier. And because there's so many Bundists in the Jewish Labor Committee, they will not touch the Palestine issue. They will not talk about it as a refuge for persecuted Jews. So the Jewish Labor Committee will stay out of the discussion of Palestine. Still really important and significant, and I do touch on them in the book, um, because they're involved in the rescue in 19, after France falls in 1940, they get involved in saving over a thousand people, including trade unionists, both Jewish and non-Jewish, but also prominent Jewish politicians and prominent cultural Jews, or Jews of art and uh, background in uh, sciences. You, we, I think a lot of you might have heard of Barry and Fry and other things like that, but this is something the Jewish Labor Committee gets very little credit for in terms of what it was involved with. But again, not talking about Palestine. One other, I should mention, side note with the Jewish Labor Committee that was interesting though, they also run a counter Olympics after the US Olympic Committee under Avery Brundage decides that they will compete in 1936 in Berlin. The Jewish Labor Committee sponsors what they call the counter Olympics at Randall's Island in New York. And it features amateur athletes from all over the country. And it's so popular in 19, it gets a lot of press coverage and it was popular enough at the end of 1936 that they decided to do another one in 1937. So again, the Jewish Labor Committee, very involved, but very much typical of the Bundists, focusing on helping the situation at hand within Europe at that time, not focusing on some sort of escape for Jews to Palestine. And that's something that's gonna be very frustrating for those Jews who, again, are either labor Zionists like Max Zeritsky, or those like David Dubinsky, who starts to lend his name, not as a labor Zionist, but as I said, a non-Zionist. He, like others, start to see Palestine as a practical solution. Even though he has a big problem with the ideology of Zionism and labor Zionism, he recognizes, as others of his generation do, that this is something that's getting really bad in Germany at this time, and therefore there needs to be some sort of way to address these problems, and Palestine, with Hitler at the helm, seems like a practical solution for these people who are really suffering, both in Germany, but also Austria, and then Czechoslovakia by the end of the 1930s. What can they do? Well, they've already been raising money every year. I already talked about the annual campaigns, funneling that money to Hitler but then they decide by the end of the 1930s that they are going to get involved in funding purchasing of land, and they refer to it as a colony, that they actually want to buy colonies for Jewish workers to live on. And of course, it fits within the socialist model. This is where you're gonna see kibbutzim develop. The kibbutzim had already existed, but they are gonna be part of this socialist enterprise. And they decide that they're gonna name this for Leon Blum. Leon Blum was at this time uh, Prime Minister of France, a socialist who very much was supportive of Istad Dru. And so those like Max Zeritsky sought opportunity. Everybody respected Leon Blum within the United States labor movement, and so they named this colony for him. They raised $100,000, which for depression era dollars was significant, and they purchased this land. So the Jewish Labor Committee, frustrating for those who want to try to do something about helping Palestine and getting immigrants in from Europe who are being persecuted by the Nazis. But this is another alternative, and people like David Dubinsky, again, will, will come to fundraisers. He'll give a speech. He'll say up front, I'm not a Zionist, but I'm here because one, he recognizes the practicality of the situation. Two, he also recognizes that there are many constituents who he is in charge of who do feel that this needs to be done. So there's really two parts of it for people in the leadership positions like Dubinsky. This is just, I wanted to show this because this is a, from that, uh, one of the main fundraising dinners. This includes not just the labor leaders and rank and file people who donated a significant amount of money. This also includes manufacturers in the garment industry. This was an issue that, although they might be in divisions on many different issues, including hours, working conditions, wages, benefits, this was an issue that brought them together. And so you'd have garment leaders, uh, leaders of the garment industry working with Dubinsky, Zeritsky, Hillman, and others when it came to this particular issue. So again, I just wanted to stress that part of the, uni the unity behind this. After they built, uh, developed the colony named for uh, Leon Bloom, they decide this is a successful project and they do it a second time. And this time, uh, 1942, they built one in the name of uh, former Supreme Court, at that time, former Supreme Court, Justice Louis Brandeis, he had died in 1941. Brandeis had been somebody who mainstreamed Zionism during the World War I period. He was someone who had brought his name to it. He believed that there was good reason for Jews to support this 
even though at the time in the 19-teens, a lot of American Jews feared being accused of dual citizenship or dual loyalty. If they supported a Jewish homeland or a Jewish state, what would that mean for them as Americans? Would they start getting questioned? Brandeis was the person who had the gravitas of Supreme Court justice, well-respected in the labor movement as well, for work he had done to help the trade unions before he was Supreme Court justice. And then, of course, for a lot of the uh, decisions he helped make on the Supreme Court that helped the labor movement. He was someone who gave a lot of credibility to the Zionist movement and to labor Zionists specifically. So they named this colony in his honor in 1942. And again, even though during this war there's great frustration that they can't do much, there isn't a lot they can do, they know by the end of 1942 that two million Jews are already dead in Poland. That gets reported by the State Department and it's published in the New York Times in November. They're talking about it. They're very open about it. So this is not something that was, I've always heard it was buried on the back pages and people didn't realize it. Based on all the speeches I'm seeing in 1941, 42, 43, these labor leaders are aware of it, they're talking about it, and they're arguing you must have Palestine as a refuge. And they're still battling Bundes who resist in the Jewish Labor Committee. But at least through these outlets where they raise money through the National Committee of Labor Palestine, they're in a position at least to help Jewish workers in Palestine develop housing. Then when immigrants come in from Europe, as few as they may be, they're in a position to put them in a home. When the war ends, the tragedy, of course, becomes well, everyone becomes aware of it, even though most of the people in the labor movement, especially the Jewish labor leaders, knew what was happening in 42, 43, 44. But the full realization in 45 creates a tremendous sense of both horror, but also a sense that Palestine is the answer in some form. It could be as a commonwealth or a homeland. It doesn't have to be a political state. But at this point, the Bundes really lose their strength, and even in the Jewish Labor Committee, they weaken to the point where the Jewish Labor Committee over the next two years move in a pro-Jewish Palestine direction, helping his Hisdadru, helping them with their labor movement, as well as their enterprise in trying to build up what becomes the apparatus for what will be a state organization in 1948. You'll see here, this is a political cartoon from, uh, this is from the uh, International Lady Garment Workers Union newspaper called Justice. And uh, it shows here how the Labor Party wins this amazing victory in July 1945. Uh, this is two months after the British have been involved in the victory over Nazi Germany, and yet Churchill's voted out by the British people in favor of a Labor Party. And American labor leaders are ecstatic. Obviously, they want to see a Labor Party win, but for those specifically who have interest in the Palestine issue, they think finally the Labor Party had been arguing for years while they were out of power how they wanted to reverse the policies of the Conservative Party under Churchill, which had restricted immigration to Palestine in what's called the McDonald White Paper of 1939. As World War II was approaching, as far as the British were concerned, they needed to placate the Arabs who had obviously control of oil that the British Navy was going to rely on, and also wanting to maintain stability for their empire. This was something that they couldn't have riots breaking out, rebellions breaking out, and so one of the things they did in, when it came to the Palestine issue was severely restrict immigration and land purchases, which obviously was extremely costly for European Jews trying to get out, and they obviously couldn't. And so this was something where the Labor Party had said every year, we would reverse this if we could get into power, we understand the importance of Palestine for the Jewish people, and they win July 1945, and as this political cartoon shows, they just continue the same policies that the Conservative Party was doing. And they're all listed here, where it shows keep Jews out of Palestine, friendly relations with Franco, that gets into other issues also that upset uh, the American labor movement. But specifically, the Palestine issue becomes a huge problem. And so Max Zaritsky is one of many American labor leaders, especially garment union leaders, who will meet with British officials, people like Walter Citrine, Sir Herbert Morrison, and others, uh, they'll get meetings with Ernest Bevan, the foreign minister in the Labor Party at that time, and they will constantly be frustrated by the pushback they get. And this is something that's gonna cause a sense of betrayal from, especially from these garment union leaders, because in 1940, at the beginning of World War II, for the British, the American labor movement had been involved in forming an organization called the American Labor Committee to Aid British Labor. They had for years been raising money, uh, sending clothes, excuse me, over to help British citizens during the war, and they felt like they really made a con contribution to help the British labor movement during the war, and this was the thanks they were getting. So this great sense of betrayal, 1945, 46, 47, incredible frustration, but as I document in the book, it's something that they go to, the American labor leaders go to great effort to try to get 
British Labour Party reverse policy. It fails, but nonetheless, I think it's worth documenting. And on top of that, I would argue that when it comes to Palestine, how the British behaved towards the Palestinian Jews was at least somewhat modified or improved by the fact that they knew they were going to be under tremendous pressure from American labor and other allies of Jewish Palestine if they were too harsh when it came to Jewish Palestine. This also takes us to another element that comes up in the book, and that's communists within the United States and within the labor movement and how they perceive the situation when it comes to Palestine. Before 1945, Soviet policy under Stalin was to support Arabs, not to support Zionists in Palestine. In 1945, Stalin changes heart. He comes to the realization that, or the recognition in his mind, that ultimately the Arabs will never be able to do what he wants, which is weaken or push the British out of the Mediterranean region. He comes to the realization in his mind that ultimately the Jews might be able to pull this off and that there are communist Jewish elements within Palestine at that time, and there were some, they were a small strand, but there were some, and that maybe through helping these Jews in Palestine, they would ultimately be able to accomplish their goal of weakening the British influence in the region and perhaps even gaining, if not an ally, a neutral Jewish homelander state. And so once that becomes the policy, communists in the United States, especially within the American labor movement, become completely involved in trying to help develop a Jewish homeland in Palestine. They are more fervent in many ways than even the Sidney Hillmans and the Max Zeritskys and the David Dubinskys. And one of the things you'll see here is right out of the Fur and Leather Workers, the International Fur and Leather Workers Union led by Ben Gold was a communist-led uh, union. And they have a uh, newspaper called the Fur and Leather Worker, which features these kinds of political cartoons showing a British guard in front of what were called displaced persons camps. These are where the Jews who survived the Holocaust were put into camps where no one knew where to send them because they couldn't go to Palestine for, because of the British uh, policy towards immigration that went back to 1939. They couldn't go to the United States either because on the books were still immigration restrictions going back to 1921 and 1924 that Congress had passed, severely restricting those emigrating from Eastern and Southern Europe, mainly targeting Jews and Italians in particular, who had come in great numbers during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So, in this particular case, the fur and leather workers want to embarrass the British, show them as being merciless. Obviously, the, the cartoon speaks for itself. And of course, this inhumane policy that for the fur and leather workers is absolutely unacceptable. And so what they get involved in is really trying to pressure the British. How do they do it? They form the American Jewish Labor Council. I've found a lot of historians get confused. They think this is the JLC. They think it's the Jewish Labor Committee. That's why I put American Jewish Labor Council. It's not the Jewish Labor Council. It's the American Jewish Labor Council. It's a communist organization. Its focus is on trying to get the British to relinquish its immigration policies and to allow, ultimately, a Jewish homeland to live up to what they say would be the, the promise of the Balfour Declaration. They do it. How? Boycotts, for one. They try to uh, leave boycotts of British goods. They will constantly ambush British leaders and uh, consulates. I have, I, when I was at the, what the time called the Public Records Office, I remember finding this amusing anecdote with an ambassador or who ultimately allowed the, uh, for, uh, the representatives of the American Jewish Labor Council to speak with him, um, and they just lambasted him. So very vocal, very furtive. Again, does it lead to changes in British policy? No. Does it demonstrate, though, what I think is a really significant grassroots movement in the United States and in the labor movement? Yes. And even though the communists will not play a major role, it's something that I thought worth bringing into the book because it shows that within the left wing, the far left wing, they're all coming together on this issue, whether it's the Bundists who are starting to look at Palestine as the practical response to the Holocaust, or whether it's the Stalinist policy of support Jewish Palestine because they're the ones who can ultimately pressure the British to leave the Mediterranean or at least diminish their influence there. So from all sectors, the British are getting it at this point. I also want to touch briefly on propaganda. This is something that's very interesting that comes up where the American labor movement, they're not alone in this, they, but they try very hard to show the rank and file workers who by the late 1940s, when it comes to the garment unions, are primarily African American and Italian American. The Jews in the garment unions have primarily moved up into leadership positions and their children, the generation after them, have primarily got into white collar positions. 
So the rank and file is no longer Jewish by the late 40s, or at least not dominantly Jewish. The leadership, yes, uh, but not the rank and file. And so they find ways to give very simple messages and narratives as ways to get these workers on board with the message. And one of those messages that's coming from organizations like Hista Jude is saying, hey, your American Revolution is very much like our, they call War of Independence in 1948. You should be seeing us in the same light with the American Revolution. We're fighting the British, you fought the British. We're fighting the savages, quote unquote, and you were fighting the savages. And together we're fighting for something. In a, a David and Goliath story, it's actually emulated as a uh, screenwriter, Ben Hecht wrote a play called a Flag is Born that ran on Broadway with starring Marlon Brando. And it very much epitomizes the same theme. Now, Ben Hecht wasn't working with the American labor movement, but he's very much in this milieu that was trying to connect the story of what was going on in Palestine in 1947 into 1948 with what was happening or what had happened in the American Revolution. So this propaganda, again, really aimed at the rank and file workers who don't have much background on the history and a very simple but potent message to try to win their support and justify all the money that you're going to see these unions, these trade unions spending when it comes to Palestine. Let me hold before I get into this part. So I've mentioned the Histo Drew campaigns. Every year this is happening. I've mentioned the colonies that are purchased. But what you're also going to see at the end of World War II are two of the most prominent garment unions, the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America, that was the one Sidney Hillman ran, and the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, which David Dubinsky is president of, will also, beyond their contributions to the Histo Drew campaign, will specifically spend money to build factories in what then is still Palestine, necktie factories, uh, indust uh, heavy industry factories. They're also going to send people to help train these Jewish workers in Palestine. So this gets back to my point about this transnational element to the story, where they're actually using their own resources to help establish not just a better economy for the Jewish Palestine, but to build the infrastructure that's ultimately going to play a key role for Palestine in its early days, especially considering how much labor was dominant part of what will become Israeli politics in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. So then the story goes back to domestic politics, the 1948 election. This, there's a whole chapter of the book on this one. Because most people who study this particular topic, and there's been a lot of books written about how domestic politics influenced President Truman's decision to ultimately recognize Israel. But I make the case that you really need to look at New York State in particular, which had 47 electoral votes at the time, the largest state in terms of electoral votes, the state that Truman knew he had to win or thought he had to win, uh, Clark Clifford, his special advisor, had made it clear to him, if you're going to win this election, you need to win New York State. And he had a tough opponent in the sense that the person he was running against as go was the governor of New York, Thomas Dewey, who had already run in 1944 and lost to Franklin Roosevelt, but was going to be a tough opponent in 1948. And Dewey and the Republican platform was very strongly pro-Jewish Palestine. So Truman had to really navigate some very difficult waters. Now, the story for this chapter really starts in November 1947. That is when the United Nations decides to partition Palestine into what essentially would be a two-state solution, a Jewish portion and a Palestinian Arab portion. Ultimately, the United States will support this partition and the resolution that passes. And I should mention, too, by the way, these Jewish labor leaders I've been talking about were very much involved in lobbying those countries who voted for partition, calling in favors that were owed to them for all they had done for these trade union movements in Europe and other parts of the world at the end of World War II. So they were involved even in the partition story. But the U.S. and Truman are behind and support the partition plan. However, a civil war essentially breaks out in December 1947. Most people focus on May 1948 when surrounding Arab countries invade Israel. But essentially a civil war breaks out earlier in December 1947 between Palestinian Jews and Palestinian Arabs because the Palestinian Arabs are angry about this partition plan. They argue the Holocaust happened in Europe. Why are we having to pay the price for this? And they go to war over this issue. Truman decides policy of the United States will be to embargo any arms sales to any side when it comes to what is happening in Palestine for fear that this will expand this into a much worse conflict, that it will allow the Soviets to enter into the situation. So Truman bans arms sales. This infuriates many people, not just in the labor movement, many, not just American Jews, but supporters of Jewish Palestine who feel this is a betrayal, that you have to help them get weapons so that they can fight against what seem like much larger numbers, even just within Palestine. 
And this shows up to Truman very clearly in February 1948. There's a special election in the Bronx between an upstart named Leo Isaacson, who represents the American Labor Party. And I'll talk what, what that's all about. He's running against this third party guy, Leo Isaacson, the American Labor Party, is running against Karl Proper, the Democratic Party. The assumption is Karl Proper will win easily. And in a stunning upset, February 1948, Isaacson wins. Now, the American Labor Party was going to be a challenge to Harry Truman from the left. Henry Wallace, the former vice president for Franklin Roosevelt, was the nominee in 1948 for the American Labor Party. This was a party that was heavily influenced from the far left, especially communists, much to the chagrin of people like David Dubinsky, who were extremely anti-communist. They were what we'd call right-wing socialists. They were socialists, but they hated communism, fought communists bitterly, sometimes fisticuffs back in the 20s and 30s, and this was something that David Dubinsky had a real problem with. So the American Labor Party, which starts in the 1930s, by the 1940s, people like David Dubinsky are very uncomfortable with this party and decide they're going to break off and form a new party, socialist party, but not communist. And that becomes the Liberal Party of New York State. And that's actually this picture. This is Harry Truman when he was vice president. I don't know if you can see from there, but the poster is for the Roosevelt Truman Wagner bill. What the idea behind this was, they wanted to create an alternative for people in New York to vote for the New Deal, to vote for those policies they loved about Franklin Roosevelt but not to have to support what they saw as the corrupt politics of the Tammany Hall Democratic machine. So instead of Democrat versus Republican, the idea was here's an alternative for people who are either in the labor movement in New York or who are sympathetic to the values of the labor movement in New York and give them a party line that politicians can run on. And this party, by the way, existed all the way into the 21st century. It finally went out of business a few years ago. But the Liberal Party of New York is really Dubinsky and the guy standing in the back, Alex Rose, he's the, at this time the vice president of the United Hap Cap and Millinery Workers Union, um, also a labor Zionist, not a Buddhist, and very supportive of Jewish Palestine. These two are the brainchilds between the Liberal Party. So Truman's got this American Labor Party on the left. On the right, he's got Strom Thurmond and the Dixiecrats who are upset with Truman on other issues, including Truman's desire to integrate the U.S. military in 1948. And so Strom Thurmond is going to lead a lot of Southern Democrats against Truman in the 48 election. So he's feeling it from the right, he's feeling it from the left. He's in a lot of trouble when it comes to New York. And of course, for New York, it's less Strom Thurmond than Dixiecrats. It's more of what's going to happen with the American Labor Party's challenge. And the reason they're so upset is twofold. One of them has to do with Taft-Hartley, which is, uh, had been passed by Congress, which severely limits the Wagner Act, which I mentioned earlier. But the other part is Truman's attitude on Palestine. And this arms embargo is upsetting. But there's still the partition plan, which the U.S. supports until March 1st. March 1st, 1948, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Warren Austin, makes a speech. Truman claims, if you read his memoirs, that he was taken by surprise by this. I looked at documents in the foreign relations series that show otherwise. Truman felt, ultimately, that there was going to be the need of a trusteeship to avoid a major war, a war that could bring the Soviets into it, potentially. So the idea of allowing this partition plan to go through, which had already created fighting within Palestine, would lead to other Arab countries getting involved, which it did. And that was something that Truman thought was too dangerous. So he didn't expect the speech to be that day because he had just met with a prominent Zionist leader from England, Chaim Weizmann. Um, and so he was embarrassed by this, but he did plan for this to come out at some point. So what does this mean? It means all those supporters of what was going to be a partition creating a Jewish state in May of 1948 are furious with Truman. Not only is there an arms embargo, which was a big reason why Karl Proper won that special election in February of 48, but now you have a reversal of policy where there's going to be a UN trusteeship, no chance for statehood, and Truman's numbers go down the tube, especially in New York. He comes for St. Patrick's Day in March of 48 for parade, and he's getting very small turnout for him. I, I didn't find anything where they said he was booed, but I wouldn't be surprised if that happened. And the Democrats in New York are abandoning him. They say, forget it. This, this guy is kryptonite. We don't want to be near him. So Truman is really going to struggle in New York based on what policy he's adopted in March of 1948. Now, ultimately, the pressure he's feeling from all these forces in New York are going to play a role, not the role, but a role, in Truman's decision in May 1948. And the one thing that can really help him is the Liberal Party. Because again, the American Labor Party as Henry Wallace as their candidate. 
and obviously for the na for the national election, he's got to worry about Strom Thurmond and the Dixiecrats. But in New York, there is the Liberal Party, which David Dubinsky is leading, and that is something that is going to provide salvation for Truman because they are going to work harder than anybody else to organize votes for Truman in New York State. Now, the interesting part of the story is Truman loses New York State. He loses to do it. But it's clear if you look at the documentation, especially if you look at Clark Clifford's notes, that Truman felt New York had to be won. And if there was any organization that was going to organize for him, and David Dubinsky talks about this as well in his own documentation, it was going to be the Liberal Party. And in fact, right here is a picture of the two of them a week after the election in November. Um, Dubinsky and Alex Rose go to the White House, and Truman said to both of them, there was a rally at Madison Square Garden that the Liberal Party had financed and promoted, and Truman said that's the highlight of the campaign. Now, was he saying it to them, to please them? I'm sure that's part of it. But if you look at New York and how important it was to get New York, it was the rally in Madison Square Garden which really became the climax. Now, why did the Liberal Party decide to do rally around him after all the bad press he was getting in the spring of 1948? Harry Truman decided ultimately to recognize Israel in May of 1948. But he still continued the arms embargo. And there was also calls for loans to help this new state of Israel, which Truman did not do right away. But the Liberal Party felt they'd gotten what they wanted and went on an all-out effort to help him against the American Labor Party candidate, in this case, Henry Wallace, as well as the Republican candidate, Thomas Dewey. So again, this is a, a chapter of the book where I really get into the domestic political influence, but the key here being New York State, and the key here being the trade union movement, not just Jews. A lot of times, again, the associations with New York Jews. If you look at Clark Clifford's notes, he's got a list of the five groups Truman has to have to win this election. Jews are number five. American labor is number two. So American labor, which included more than just the issue of Palestine, as I mentioned, Taft-Hartley, and vetoing Taft-Hartley was going to be key to that as well. But this is something that's clearly on Truman's mind. And so I just wanted to show this as sort of the final cap to the whole thing. That's Philip Murray on your left and William Green on your right. Those are the presidents of the uh, AFL and CIO. And this, again, as I mentioned earlier, is the one issue they come together. They visited the White House. This is two years after Israel becomes a state in 1950. And they come to pressure Truman at that time to uh, get a loan for Israel, a major loan that uh, the U.S. government hadn't yet provided for Israel. So, again, this shows you how far things had come, where five years before the AFL and the CIA merge, you've got their leaders coming together on this issue, despite what had been a very acrimonious relationship for the years leading up to it. And then just sort of a postscript here. This is David Dubinsky providing a check for not thousands of dollars, like in the 20s, 30s, this is $1 million, to build a hospital uh, in Beersheba. And it just shows, I stopped the story in 1950, basically, but this story goes on and on through the 50s and 60s. More and more infrastructure being built by American labor dollars. You're also going to see the building of what's called the Afro-Asian Institute in 1960, which half of it is funded by, what at that point, the AFL-CIO. And the idea was that Israel would become a training ground for trade union leaders, aspiring trade union leaders, in Africa and in Asia to bring them to Israel, to train them to become the future labor leaders, non-communist future trade uh, labor leaders, which is why the AFL-CIO was very much involved in backing it. So at this point, I figure I'll wrap it up. There's obviously a lot of issues, but these are the main points I wanted to hit on, and then I'm happy to address any questions anyone has. Now we open it up for questions and uh, responses. If you would wait till the microphone reaches you, if you would use the microphone, and if you would identify yourself before speaking, we would appreciate it. A gentleman over here. I, I, really a lovely talk. You are? Roger Meyer. Thank you. Uh, lovely talk. My, I only have two comments. One is Winston Churchill wasn't prime minister in 1939, and he was a Christian Zionist. And he was appalled by what Bevan was doing. Uh, no, it, it, actually, it, it's cited in, in the biography. You're not wrong, but I'll wait to finish now. OK, yeah. and then the other piece is the State Department was continuously opposed to Israel. And I suspect that, you know, that, that, that the UN speech came very much out of what was coming out of the State Department. So the first point, you're dead on. He was not Prime Minister in 39. I was just referencing the policy that goes into place. 
Yes, but Churchill also allowed those policies to continue while he was prime minister during World War II. Even though he was sympathetic to the Zionist cause, he didn't change or reverse the policy that the conservative government had started in 39. So that's, I was just getting at that, and how so many people were critical in the labor movement, at least, of Churchill for that. And then, yeah, the State Department, um, which had a reputation then for having potentially anti-Semitic perspectives when it came to the issue of Jewish homeland, Jewish state, uh, and accusations that flew at the time, uh, and it's something that George Marshall felt, and these, you know, people have written about this extensively, but George Marshall felt that this is something, when it comes to U.S. national security, is not good for the United States to recognize or support a Jewish state in the Middle East, that this would go against all of the things the U.S. and its foreign policy were trying to do when it came to preventing Soviet influence, and when it came to maintaining a stable environment, especially where oil, which at that point was absolutely critical to the U.S. Navy, not so much domestically at this point for U.S. consumption, but for the military, where and for the Marshall Plan, to help ensure that oil reached Europe to for the Marshall Plan countries. So from a national security perspective, you know, he made that argument. Ultimately, Truman countered him. And of course, there's a famous, in the book I talk about a little bit, but there's other people who covered it in much more depth, where basically Clark Clifford and George Marshall are in a tete-a-tete -tete in a meeting right before Truman decides to recognize Israel. And George Marshall basically threatens Truman, saying, I'm, I wouldn't vote for you if you ultimately decide to do this, because it's clearly a domestic political maneuver. Uh, and Truman was rather shaken by that, but it didn't stop him ultimately from recognizing Israel, despite the State Department's opposition. Couldn't have been that good. <laughs> yes. David Nichols, um, and colleague of Adam at the histor historian's office. Um, I was curious, th there's a long-term um, decline in what's, what we know as the Labor Party in Israel, but has been different parties at different times. Um, and uh, it, is this, in terms of U.S. support for Israel, for, from U.S. unions, um, do you see that decline um, earlier than Begin? Prime Minister, I, th does it play into this, the aftermath of the story that you're telling? No, I mean, and if, assuming I'm answering you right, the AFL-CIO is supportive of the Israeli government all through the Begin period. I talk in the book how during the uh, Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 82, they took out a huge ad in the New York Times saying, we stand with Israel. And I recently spoke with a scholar who was doing work on the, the period of the negotiations between Israel and Egypt leading to the Camp David Accord, and he was saying how he was so perplexed because a lot of American groups who Sadat reached out to was trying to win them over to get Israel to make concessions for what becomes the Camp David Agreement. Um, saw Sadat's perspective except one. He said it was the American labor movement. He couldn't understand why. And it just shows you how strong American labor stood by Israel past the changeover to Likud in 77. Yes. We'll get to you. Uh, I mean, uh, Hillman I was already uh, had already passed on in 1941. But, uh, but there were leaders of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers uh, after World War II, mm -hmm. World War II. And uh, what was the role of the Amalgamated in, in supporting Hista Group and uh, the formation of Israel? Sure. So Sidney Hillman dies of a heart attack in November 1946. His, so, yeah, but his vice president takes over Jacob Potofsky, and Jacob Potofsky is pro-Israel. So when he comes in, you get even more strongly support for what becomes Israel than you had under Hillman. Although Hillman, as I mentioned, was already moving in that direction, and he died suddenly, so we don't know exactly how much further he was going to go, but it looked like he was moving in a direction of becoming supportive of what will ultimately become a state, not just a homeland. But Potofsky, who leads the amalgamated for years after that, very strongly pro Thank you, David Berwitz. Uh, Golda Meir famously started out as a labor leader in the U.S. and moved to Israel. Was she one of many, or was she sort of unique? In terms of coming from in, the U.S. In terms of coming from U.S. labor leadership. She was relatively unique, because a lot of the ones who came to uh, Palestine came directly from Europe, like David Ben-Gurion and those like them. But Gold, uh, Golda Meir, known as Goldie Meyerson when she was in the United States, she's a big part of the story because she's one of the really the, the, the founding mothers, fathers, I don't know what would be the right term, but she's very much involved with Histadrut. 
when it forms, and she's in that delegation I mentioned way back in 1921 that came over to try to win support and ultimately win over Max Pine. She's part of that group because obviously, having been in the United States, and obviously her English is fluent, but she knows the culture, and so they sent her. So she's a big part of the relationship between Hista Drut and the American Trade Union Movement. She's in a lot of the different events that take place in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s. So she's a big player. But as far as others like her, I'm not aware of others in Histadrut or involved in the Israeli political scene who started out in the U.S. first and then came to Palestine. Leon Fink, uh, editor of the journal Labor. Uh, clearly the labor leadership, especially from the garment unions, embraced um, the uh, early Israeli state. But I wonder if there were, uh, were any tensions um, in terms of their attitude towards the proper role of a labor movement in relation to the state. Um, the Americans, uh, AFL had been pretty um, uh, demanding in, in terms of that a labor movement shouldn't uh, be part of a state apparatus. They talked about, you know, autonomy, and independent unions. Whereas the, as you made clear, I think the history group was very much a part of the, the state in Israel, has even owned a lot of the economy. Uh, did did you find any tensions um, when the uh, Israelis came to Israel, or or did they, uh, you know, the the Hillman types? I could imagine. Um, kind of looked um, enviously at the uh, how socialistic Israel was, but not the AFL types, I wouldn't think. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because I had the same question when I was looking at this particular topic. What I, I did find were a couple of things. One, that not just AFL but others, they always saw this as a potential commonwealth or homeland, as the Balfour Declaration talked about. State doesn't really come into the lexicon until very late in the game basically around 1947, that anybody's really talking about a political state. So you might say, well, that's a rationalization, because this history has got their army in the Haganah, and it's developing all this infrastructure, and American labor's playing a role in helping that. So how is this not a state enterprise? You could say they were turning a blind eye because they wanted to support their Jewish constituents, and that this was a way to earn points with them. I suspect that's part of it. I also think there was a lot of sympathy. I think William Green was very much committed to, he's one of these sympathetic, um, committed Christian who believed in what was happening in Palestine with these Jews and been persecuted first in pogroms in Eastern Europe in the early 20th century and then of course the Nazis in the 1930s and that this was the justified solution to their problem and therefore willing to overlook some of the uncomfortable aspects of the, the uh, state infrastructure part of it and focus more on this as a practical solution to a very difficult problem. But that's my conjecture. I've never seen anything where anyone else for that matter in the AFL explains this discomfort they may be having between the fact that they're ultimately, by helping this country, building up what becomes the state structure for Israel. But at least in terms of the lexicon, no one's talking state in the labor movement until 47, except for some labor Zionists. And just to follow up, I, I assume they also didn't have problems with the, the role of communists within um, Israel, who did play a role in, uh, in parts of the history of Ben-Gurion himself had been yeah, they had problems with that, <laughs> and that comes up actually in a, a few different ways. Uh, issues I bring up briefly in the book with the World Federation of Trade Unions, and also in terms of communist influence in Israel. Um, well, even more than that, in 1948, most people, especially my students, think it was the United States that helped ensure Israel would win the war against the Arab countries by providing arms. But as I already told you, it was an embargo, so then they think, well, it must be France. And France would become a key arms supplier in the 50s. But it was the Soviet Union through Czechoslovakia that arguably is the reason why Israel wins the 1948-49 war. And the fact that Israel has this relationship with the Soviet Union from 1948 to 1950 made a lot of these trade unionists like Dubinsky and Green very uncomfortable. And they wrote letters to the leadership in Israel at that point expressing their dismay that Israel is not coming out clearly on the U.S. side in the burgeoning Cold War. And it's only when the Korean War breaks out and Israel finally decides to align with the United States in the Korean War that the Soviets say, we're done with you, and relations break off. But even in the period of 48 to 50, 
there was discomfort with that relationship. And yes, even before that, as you mentioned, there was communist influence within the labor movement within Israel, and it made them uncomfortable. But they also felt his Roots leadership was firmly in control, and that ultimately they were going to, as the American labor movement was doing, they were going to marginalize those communists so that they wouldn't become significant. So let me get a question in here. And it has to do with what the American labor movement argued for and what it didn't argue for. Uh, and so at conventions and at meetings, uh, the labor movement specialized in resolutions, um, and they issued a lot of them. And so they're critical of the Roosevelt administration for, and then the Truman administration for not taking certain steps. At any point, did they focus on, say, American immigration law? And so if the problem was the fate of European Jewry, American immigration law, let's just say, is not a small obstacle uh, to the survival of many people. And yet those doors remain firmly closed. So they say open them up elsewhere, but did they take on the Roosevelt or Truman administration on American domestic immigration policy? And if not, why not? Yeah, so they did to some extent. I did find cases where people like Dubinsky are arguing with Truman for exemptions to that immigration quota for these Jews. Uh, but the American labor movement is uh, traditionally to that point been against having open immigration because of the fear of bringing cheap labor into the United States, which will then compete against their jobs. So it was going to be an uphill battle to really make major pushes for reform of that legislation. But I did find some evidence that there were attempts to get exemptions made, at least after World War II, when you had all these displaced persons sitting in these refugee camps. And this was something that, of course, was being in the media, it was broadcast in the media, all over the television, but obviously in the print media and the radio. And so they did make some pushes on Truman to try to get him to open up on that. Um, but ultimately, they all coalesced around Palestine because that solves all the problems. Those in the labor movement who don't want to see Jews coming into the United States because of their concern about competition and cheap labor, Palestine's a good answer. For those who have their concerns that Jews will never really have peace from prejudice and anti-Semitism unless they have their own place to go, Palestine's the answer. So it really solves a lot of problems. And then for those committed laborites, Histadrut is an impressive labor organization, stronger and more progressive than most around the world at that time. So for that reason also, a lot of people in the labor movement and others within the liberal movement in the United States will look to Jewish Palestine as the right place for these Jewish displaced persons who survived the Holocaust to go. And even before that period of the Holocaust, they looked at Palestine as the right place to go for the same reasons. Thank you. Kay Oshel. Um, I was wondering about the Communist uh, International Fur and Leather Workers Union. Did it did it ever actually represent workers with collective bargaining agreements with employers? And how long was it in existence? Fur and leather workers come into existence early 20th century. And yeah, they're involved with collective bargaining and the like. They are disbanded in the 1950s after McCarthyism comes after them. And even though my book stops in 1950, I was curious of the story. So I kept reading the fur and leather worker newspaper. And I saw them come under attack. And Ben Gold ultimately comes before the Senate committee with McCarthy. And ultimately, they just are so weakened by the attacks that they fold. Uh, James Benton, uh, my question is about something you briefly mentioned. Uh, you talked about the makeup of the garment unions shifting as um, the, the newer generation of Jews leaves and enters white collar professions. That body is largely largely replaced by African Americans. Was there any evidence in your research or in the in the book about any potential conflicts between uh, his group and African-American civil rights in the U.S.? I know that uh, Potofsky, for instance, wrote a column, it, not, not regularly, but infrequently, about uh, civil rights in the Amsterdam News, for instance. And we know about the struggle that the involvement of the larger labor movement civil rights movement in the 60s, but was there any type of conflict between these elements in the 
1930s and 1940s. I didn't see it, although I was curious myself. But basically what I see is the cooperative relationship you've mentioned here. For most of these most committed socialists, they're abhorred by the racism they see. A lot of them are, are instrumental in what becomes Operation Dixie in 1948, trying to organize the unions in the South. Um, that was the CIO. But this is something where, at least at that time, they view civil rights as just as important as any of the other progressive issues that interest them. And they see Jews getting to Palestine in the same milieu as the civil rights movement at that time, and they're very supportive. Having said that, though, there are issues that come up after my book's done in the 1960s in terms of leadership. You will see, I looked at one point, the leadership in like 1950, the ILGW, David Kaminsky. It's all white or Jewish, I should say, and, or Italian. And there's one woman and no African Americans. So Robert Parmet wrote a good biography on David Dubinsky that gets into this issue of his contradictions when it came to issues of gender and race, even though the platform and the agenda was always progressive, inside internally there were some contradictions. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Too. I've got a, three fact questions about things I thought you said or perhaps I misheard. Uh, you said that Stalin broke off with Israel around the Korean War issue, uh, but they had relations, the Soviet Union had relations with Israel until the Six Day War, is my understanding. Maybe I'm getting my facts wrong. Yeah, no, my, from my understanding, there was a break in diplomatic relations at that point. They might have maintained some sort of relationship, but when you get to 67, Soviet Union supplying Egypt and Syria with the weapons that Israel is very concerned about. Well, right. right now they've got relations with everybody in the Middle East, including Iran and Israel and Hezbollah. You know, so, I mean, it's not right. It's not impossible. And, and they may have. I'd have to double check back in the 60s to see if there was some sort of reestablishment. But my understanding is formal diplomatic relations ended once the Israelis decided to side with the West when it came to the Korean War. And when was Golda Meir ambassador to Moscow? I think it was after that, but anyway, uh, I, I mean, I've definitely the Soviet Union shifted, no doubt about that. Yeah, it's not formal end of diplomatic relations, it was a cold yeah. relationship at that point. Okay. Uh, and did you ascribe uh, the State Department's position on Israel to anti-Semitism, or were you just, just describing what people were accusing the State Department I'm of? I'm describing what people are accusing the State Department of. Okay, all right. And the third uh, question is concerning this, uh, I guess you might say, institute, I didn't... I Afro-Asian Institute. Right. Uh, how significant was that, and uh, how long did it last? In other words, they're bringing African uh, unionists to uh, Israel for training. Asian as well. Um, it's a small part of my book because it goes well beyond 1950. I'm hoping scholars look further into it because it's a fascinating story. My understanding is that it, it stopped by the end of the 1960s, so it didn't last very long. And I'm not so sure it had much of a significant impact in terms of the trade union movements in Africa and Asia. But what I found fascinating was the fact that Israel became the center point where American labor was willing to finance this project. And it was something that I suspect the U.S. government probably had some interest support for. I didn't find any specific evidence of that. But. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. But my understanding is that it petered out by the end of the 60s. I have to double check, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah. This program. So in Christian Osterman's absence, let me ask one of the questions that Christian often poses uh, to speakers at this seminar, and it has to do with how you go about constructing the story and the sources that you use. Um, this is a heavily archivally based research project, so in your footnotes and in your bibliography, it's clear that there are multiple archival collections that you've used. Could you just talk something about both the union papers uh, and, and government papers that allowed you to do this? And so that's the Christian question. And my follow-up to that would be, given what you found, which seems quite substantial, why has there been so little work on this prior to your book? Okay. I'll start with the first part, which is the documentation. Documentation is from the United States, England, and from Israel. 
Um, in the United States, I, as I started digging in, it became clear I was going to have to look at the records of these various unions as well as the AFL and the CIO. Um, so that is, fortunately, a lot of it was concentrated in New York, um, but I had to go to Cincinnati for some of the material. I had to go to upstate New York, Cornell University, where the, uh, a lot of the labor records are. Um, and that's pretty much where I had to go in the U.S. I did a little bit, um, some of the William Green papers, right, if I remember, in Ohio State, so I go to Columbus, Ohio. Um, so I basically focused initially on these papers of the unions, not government records at that point. Once I felt like I understood sort of the key points of the story that were coming through the union records, then I decided I would go into the government records. And that meant looking at what's now the National Archives in England, back then it was the Public Records Office, to see how the Fur and Leather Workers Union, based on what I was already reading about in their records, how that was being uh, looked at by British government officials, so what was the response to what was going on, uh, also looking at specifically British Labor Party records, and then in Israel, I looked at uh, the Central Zionist Archives, have a lot of material from the pre-1948 period that was really helpful in terms of Istad Root and their organizational structure, also, um, tell you another great thing and beyond these government records and union records was a diary I found. Uh, a guy named Joseph Schlossberg, who I didn't talk about, he's, he's fairly prominent in the book. He was the secretary for the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America. He was a staunch labor Zionist and he maintained a phenomenal diary over years. And he had all these great lines that I got to bring in for quotes because he had such a remarkable overview of what was happening at the time. For example, at one point he talks about how the Bundes in 1943, who are still really pushing against having any kind of uh, support for Palestine within the Jewish Labor Committee, and he says, these guys are living in the past, in the early 20th century, when you know, the Bund meant something, but these communities in Lithuania and Poland are gone. They've been destroyed by the Nazis by 1943. So he's all these great lines that help contextualize some of the stuff I was seeing in the government records. That was very, very helpful. Um, your second question, I forget it now. So you broken ground. Why is there been practice? Okay. Well, first of all, I'm very thankful that no one broke ground because it took 20 years to finally get this published in book form, and I was nervous the whole time that somebody was going to do this project. My guess, and it's simply a guess, is that as the American labor movement is weakened, I feel like the scholarship focusing in, and you can speak on this as well, on labor history in general diminished, and then, of course, the American labor movement support for Israel as the American labor movement's weakened, and the labor movement in Israel is weakened. This done through is a shadow of what it was. I think just people aren't really thinking about it in the way they would have if those both those movements had stayed stronger. In my case, it just worked out that I was interested as a historian in mid-20th century U.S. history. I was interested in domestic politics and international relations, so it really was this great synergy between the two that allowed me to find a way to deal with both fields of interest for me, but I suspect that's why most people don't really Decline so much. <laughs> uh, I mean, I would. I, I don't have a great answer. Um, there are some things you can speak to now. Hista Drew was part of this environment that the Labor Party dominated through the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and by the late 70s, there were resentments in society that had built up against them. These, so these were the Eastern European Jewish establishment people, like Golda Meir. And there were a lot of people from other parts of the Middle East, Jews who had emigrated, who felt like second-class citizens, who felt subject to racism within Israel. So they became friendly towards Likud. And then, of course, there were those who felt that the Labor Party, in addition to sort of getting corrupted and fat on the high horse, um, also wasn't doing enough to strengthen Israel security-wise. That's obviously where Likud comes in. So that might explain, in part, um, it's weakening. I suspect the other part of it is the reforms that led to a more capitalist system was appealing to people who wanted to make more money and felt restricted by a socialist system in place. And that probably played a role in the same way it has here. But that's just my conjecture. I don't really have anything in the literature that I've seen. Hi, I'm John Martin. I'm a research fellow here. Dazzling presentation, really, really super. You really 
is there a bottom line finally? Could the state of Israel have been established without that help? Boy, that's a good question because I always debate in my mind whether I should say this is the reason Israel forms versus a reason that Israel forms. In the end, I would say it's a very important reason why Israel forms. I'd be reluctant to say Israel could not have formed without it because there's so many non-government organizations, which I hope more books come out on these other groups that are involved. A lot of them Jewish groups, but not all, who are very helpful in ensuring Israel gets financial support, political support, etc. So I don't think American labor is the reason, and without it, Israel wouldn't have happened. But I don't think it would have taken the shape it did. And obviously, it would have been a much harder, and it would have probably been a different looking Israel if you didn't have American labor involved in this effort. One thing that struck me in the various deliberations and positions put forward by various labor groups is the absence of much commentary upon or reflection about the Arab side of the question. So this is a very one-sided, devoted um, uh, approach uh, to, to supporting um, uh, the Commonwealth or the State of Israel. But did the Arab question come up in labor debates? And if so, in what way? Yeah, so early it comes up because of the Bundes. The Bundes aren't just focused on this issue of letting Jews go to Palestine as escapism. We need to focus on Jewish culture and identity here in Europe. It also was a concern that you are inevitably going to create a conflict that you cannot address, that these Jews will become imperialist exploiters of the Arab workforce. They will ultimately dislodge these Arabs from their homes, and that this is one reason why you should oppose the Zionist enterprise. So Bundes were talking about that even as early as the 30s, maybe even the 20s. Within other circles, there is the left-wing discussions about this communists initially before 1940. But um, what you'll see in the pushback is the uh, argument from labor Zionists, including within the American labor movement, I've seen Max Zerifsky Sir- talk about this in the 30s. The problem is that, and it puts it in class terms, the problem is that you have these Arab landlords who are exploiting the Arab workers, and that once you have the Jews come in, that they're going to get rid of this class problem by creating his Hizdadru, and that ultimately the Arab workers will actually do well in the system. So, for example, Hista Drew creates an Arab newspaper, but they don't let Arabs join Hista Drew. That was the interesting part. Not until 1957 are Arabs allowed to join Hista Drew because the labor Zionist philosophy is that in order to ensure that Jews have, you know, are workers of the land and don't become just landlords exploiting Arab workers, you have to make sure that only Jews are doing these working class jobs, whether it's farming, whether it's the working class city jobs, Therefore, they don't let Arabs in on that basis. But there are those, especially in the left wing, who are very uncomfortable with what they see as an exploitive situation, a situation that will lead to Arabs ultimately in the end being you know, forced to work in bad conditions. But from Hista Drew's perspective, the argument was, you know, that's not something we endeavor to do. Our goal is to make sure Jews hire Jews, and we'll hopefully be able to help in time by our model get rid of this exploitive system of Arab landlords who are exploiting their Arab peasants. It's a very convoluted way. I never really bought that argument, but it's what they talk about at these annual dinners and these campaign events, where it does come up, and they do address it in that way, very idealistic terms, but hard to make that argument when you're not allowing Arabs to join the organization until 1957, that somehow your system is going to act as a model that is going to somehow improve the situation. But on the same point, another interesting thing that comes up in the language and the rhetoric, they always talk in terms of this wasteland, of this desert wasteland that they turn into an oasis. And this is something that a lot of the labor leaders pick up on in their language. And a lot of those sympathetic to labor Zionists, like Albert Einstein, he gives a couple speeches at these annual fundraisers, and he talks about how these Jews in his Drew are turning this wasteland, these empty spaces, into you know, these productive places. And of course, within that, there's completely ignoring the Arab aspects, the Arab people living there, what they've done. And so it, it's something where I think they just turn the blind eye. And then... On that note, I am going to draw this to a close, but remember, we reconvene on Monday, January 14th, where you have a panel of five authors talking about their four books.
Uh, so we enjoy, uh, invite you to join us uh, on Monday, January 14th, 2019 for the opening session of what I think is a terrific lineup uh, in the spring. Please join us for a glass of wine and some holiday mixed nuts um, uh, at a reception uh, in our room uh, next door. Um, do pick up the flyer with the uh, listings for uh, next term. We very much appreciate that. Thank you uh, for everyone for coming out this afternoon, and thank you, Adam.